This morning, I want to share with you on what the, the translators call the parable of the prodigal son, but I really believe it's a parable of our loving Abba Father, a parable of the loving Abba Father as we focus on the object of the father's love, which is that younger son and the elder son. And next week we will look at the eldest son, but for this morning we want to look at the younger son and look at the, the love of, of a father. Praise the Lord. We want to look at Luke from Luke chapter 15 and verse 11. Thank you, Sia, for sharing so wonderful. We rejoice with you and Zama. God richly, richly bless you all. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Crystal, for that beautiful song. What kind of love is this? That's one, that's my main favorite song of yours. And so I requested that song because this morning it's all about the love of God. All about the love of God. Hallelujah. God loves us so much. The Father loves his family so much this morning. And that's what our prayer is all about, that you would sense the love of God, this love of our heavenly Father, even during this difficult time. Praise the Lord. Reading from verse 11, and he said, A certain man had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falleth to me. And he divided unto them his living. And not many days after the younger son gathered all together and took his journey into a far country, and there wasted his substance with riotous living. And when he had spent all, there arose a mighty famine in that land, and he began to be in want. And he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into his fields to feed swine, pigs. And he would fain have filled his belly with the husks that the swine did eat, and no man gave unto him. And when he came to himself, he said, How many hired servants of my father have bread enough and to spare, and I perish with hunger. I will arise and go to my father, and I will say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee, and am no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hired servants." And he arose and came to his father. But when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in thy sight, and I am no more worthy to be called thy son. But the father said unto his servants, Bring forth the best robe, and put it on him, put a ring on his hand, and shoes on his feet, and bring hither the fatted calf, and kill it, and let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead, and is alive again. He was lost, and is found, and they began to be merry. Now his eldest son was in the field, and as he came and drew nigh to the house, he heard music and dancing. And he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said unto him, Thy brother is come, and thy father had killed a fatted calf, because he had received him safe and sound. And he was angry and would not go in. Therefore the father came. Therefore came his father out and entreated him. And he answering said to his father, Lo, these many years do I serve thee, neither transgressed I at any time thy commandment, and yet thou never gavest me a kid that I might make merry with my friends. 
But, but as soon as this thy son was come, which had devoured thy living with harlots, thou hast killed for him the fatted calf. And he said unto him, Son, thou art ever with me, and all that I have is thine. It was meet that we should make merry and be glad for this thy brother. Take note, the elder brother said, your son, the father rectifies it and says, your brother was dead and is alive, was lost and is found. Praise God for his word. Luke chapter 15 is has three parables there. And each one of those parables speaks about the love of God. The Father here is none else but God. But a, background, a backdrop to this parable or to these three parables, verse 1 and 2 declares, Then all the tax collectors and sinners drew near to him, to Jesus, to hear him. And the Pharisees and scribes complained, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. Now the Pharisees and publicans were like the main people of the law of the old covenant. And they could not understand Jesus' love for sinners, that he could receive sinners and even eat with them. And when Jesus knew of their thoughts, he shared three parables. The first parable Jesus said, spoke, he says, which man of you having a hundred sheep and he lose the one, will he not leave the 99 that are well and go and search for the one that is lost? until he finds it. And when he founds it, finds it, he lays it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and neighbors, saying, Rejoice with me, for I found my sheep that was, was lost. Jesus also says, I say to you that likewise, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents, then over 99 just persons who need no repentance. What? Look how God thinks. You see, the 99 that are well, they are enjoying all the benefits of the house. But this one that is lost is what the Father is actually focusing on. Then the second parable, he speaks about a woman having 10 pieces of silver, and if he lo she loses one, she lights a candle, and she sweeps that house, searching for this one that was lost. And when she finds it, she calls her friends together, and says, come and rejoice for me, I have found the, I found the piece which I lost. And then, Jesus also says here, yeah, this whole chapter is in red, meaning it's, it's all Jesus speaking. Just the beginning there where it speaks about the mind of these Pharisees and publicans, the religious people. You know, religious people can be so cruel and harsh, and yet they don't have an experience with the love of God. And this woman says... Rejoice with me, for I found the peace which I lost. You take notes, the shepherd said, Rejoice with me, for I found the sheep that were lost. It didn't say rejoice with me for the 99. I mean, 99 is so much more than one. This woman didn't say rejoice with me for the nine pieces that never got lost. Nine is so much more than one piece. But he's saying... She says, rejoice with me, for I found the peace which I lost. 
And then she says, likewise I say unto you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God. So even the angels of God have a party when one sinner comes to repentance. And so the third parable is what we are focusing on this morning, is a parable of this love of God, this loving Heavenly Father that has two sons that really don't understand and don't know the love of the Father fully. And um, as I said, we're looking at this one son this morning, and next Sunday we look at the elder son also, but it also shows the love of the Father. Many times in the Old Testament, God revealed his nature and character through a revelation of his many names. Whenever God revealed his names, he was revealing his nature. However, in Psalm 138 and verse 2, God's word says he's magnified his word above even above all his name. He says, David says, I'll worship towards thy holy temple and praise thy name for thy loving kindness and for thy truth. For thou hast magnified thy word above all thy name. So God gives us a revelation of his name to show us his nature and his character. Then God gives us his word which he says he made even bigger. He magnified above all his name. Then when you get to the New Testament in Hebrews chapter 1, and from verse 1, it says, God who had sundry times and in divers manners spoke in times past unto our fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. So take note, family of God here, in the service this morning, and each one of you that are online, it's God's name, God's word, and God's son is the spoken word of God. That's what the Bible teaches us. God's name, God's, God's, God's names, God's word, and then the teachings and the life of Jesus is a spoken word of God. But it can become the present proceeding word of God for you in your situation as the Holy Spirit brings a word and zeroes it in towards you and your situation in your life. Your life goes through many different situations at various times along your life's journey. It's not just one straight road. There are mountains, there are valleys, there's things we don't foresee that end up happening along life's journey. And we have been looking at the many facets of who God is, and we will continue to look at that. And in the many parables, especially in the New Covenant, I believe that the purpose of this, as we look at God, our Father, it is for us to understand how He relates to us in whatever our situations that we go through. You see, tonight, this morning, as much as your faces differ, so do all our needs. We don't go through the same situations in life. Every one of us have our own crosses to bear. 
every one of us have our own set lane to run. However, if you know the different facets of God through his word, you begin to understand how he relates to you personally in your personal situation that you go through. It's very, very important. And so we have been looking at a number of things. We looked at God is a righteous judge. And so it's wonderful to know that God judged his son on your behalf. So now you are set free from judgment, being judged. That's why the Bible says no weapon formed against you will prosper. In every tongue that has risen up against you in judgment, you must condemn it. It's your inheritance, the heritage of the servants of the Lord. And your righteousness and you that are online is of the Lord. He has said so. And so you stand in that righteousness because Jesus was actually judged by his own father. Think about that. We think maybe the Jews crucified him, put him on the cross. Or we think the Romans may have done that. This Roman soldier plunged the spear in his side. But every night, Moan and I read Isaiah 6, uh, 53. Uh, and we pray. That's after our family altar. And it's, it's, it's really something so very wonderful. And so God is a righteous judge. And so vengeance does not belong unto you. Vengeance belongs unto God. God does not put you in a place where you must revenge your enemies because God judged his son. And he will repay you whatever your enemies do to you. But leave the revenge alone. Learn how to love your enemies and pray for those that despitefully use you so you keep your heart absolutely pure. We also looked at that God is a wealthy businessman. So we see all these different facets. Maybe some of you have come to the service this morning and you've got some enemies. They may be trying to take you to court or you may have some cases that you're dealing with. And so you understand how God is relating to you in that area. But then God is also a wealthy businessman. So now this is talking to you about God in the area of business. And we looked at that. But Isaiah 48 verse 17 is one of our favorite scriptures in the church. Thus saith the Lord thy Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. I am the Lord thy God which teacheth thee to profit. And leadeth thee in the way you should go. So when you're talking about business now, God is very interested in your profit. And he is a wealthy businessman. We looked at those parables. And uh, God wants you to be wealthy. And he will relate to you if you're not experiencing profit in your life. And he will teach you how to profit. And he will lead you as a heavenly father how to profit. But you must become teachable. You must humble yourself and allow even the word of God in the church that's being ministered to teach you how to profit. Because when you profit in your life, it brings God great pleasure. God takes pleasure in the prosperity of his servants. And Shia mentioned this. God, we saw that God is a farmer. And that is wonderful. He puts his word in our mouth. He covers us in the shadow of his hand that he may plant the heavens. So God is a farmer. He gives us the seed in his word. But even as Seir shared, he also gives you the seed in money form for you to sow it so you can increase financially. So the word and financial seeds are great seeds to sow. Nothing can come 
uh, to the level of the Word of God, just sowing your money and you don't understand what you're doing is not good enough. You need a revelation that God's Word is God's seed for you to sow from your mouth. You must speak it. But then he also lays the foundations of the earth. And then he'll also say to you, you are mine. There's love there in sowing and reaping, whether you're sowing the word or sowing your finances. We also looked at the fact that God is a builder. He is building our lives to be his dwelling place in our hearts, first and foremost, individually. But then he's building us into one another that we would be a spiritual house together. And that is why Jesus said, upon the rock of revelation now, revelation of Christ, revelation of who you are, Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against. Now, all these pictures are the many sides of God. And you will spend the whole of eternity discovering who God is and who you are in God because you are created in his image and in his likeness. And this morning, we're looking at God as a loving heavenly father. It's just another picture of God. Now the loving heavenly father has to do with relationship. So we looked at all these different facets as to do with whatever you're going through in your life. But a loving heavenly father has to do with how you relate to God as a father. In fact, it's the first step in your walk with God. In John 1.12, Jesus said, as many as received Jesus as Lord and Savior, to them God gives the power to be called the sons of God. And so you are a son of God, not by your performance, but by virtue of the fact that you are born of God. You're not born of the will of man, you're not born of blood, but you are born of God. And so in your relationship now with God, you relate to him as a father. And seeing God as a father is for the purpose of relationship with God. God is our loving Abba Father. Say Abba Father. Yes, that's what God wants every one of you to know today every one of you, that he loves you so much, more than you ever know, that you're the apple of his eye, that your value to God is the value of Jesus. Your value to God is the blood of Jesus that redeemed you. And that is why I love that song. What kind of love is this? And so in Ephesians chapter 3, it speaks about verse 17, Christ dwelling in our hearts by faith that you may be able to comprehend, to understand what is the breadth, the length, the depth, and the height. And to know the love of Christ that passeth knowledge. Think about it. You can have an experience with the love of Christ. And even though it passes knowledge, it's beyond what anybody can feed you with that knowledge. And the purpose of that is that you might be filled with all the fullness of God. Can you see that in the word of God? That when you have an experience with the love of God, you also, it takes you, that experience takes you for you to be filled, not just with some of God, but with all the fullness of God. Why? Because he loves you so much. And he loves you, Ma Anne, so much there at home. And he loves me too, Ma Anne, just as much as he loves you. And the purpose of that is that you, Ma Anne, may be filled with all the fullness of God. Rise up 
and be healed because the spirit that raised Jesus from the dead is a life quickening spirit and the family of God agree with me here this morning that you are being quickened through the love of God in the name of Jesus, hallelujah. And so to understand this love of God, let's look at this young son and look at the object of the love. The translators focused on the object, but I really, for me, I'm focusing on the love of God through the object or the focus of his love. This younger son didn't deserve it. And you know, my friends, you don't deserve to be loved by God. You'll never be able to earn it. And he loves you. There's nothing you can do to cause God to love you more. There's nothing you can do or not do to cause God to love you less. One thing about the love of God, God is not a respecter of persons. He doesn't love anyone more than the other. Just think about that. You may see somebody more blessed than you, and you may think God loves them more than you. No, never. A million times, never. He loves all of us the same. And that's this wonderful God that we serve, that even when you turn away from him, he doesn't stop loving you. Even when you don't believe, he does not deny himself. He still loves you. And so it's what kind of love is this? It makes you keep coming back for more. Because the love of God leads us to repentance. You see, God is not forcing you to do anything. This relationship with God is all because he first loved you. And now you love him. This relationship with God is that he first chose you. You didn't choose him. God was not lost. You were lost. And he searched for you and found you. And that's how we have to see it. The devil wants us to think we've got to earn this type of love. No, you don't. There's nothing. You just have to believe it. And it's the proof of it is that he sent Jesus, his only begotten son. And he, God the Father, judged Jesus on the cross. Because his justice needed to be fulfilled so he could show mercy to you. That's how much he loves you. And God wants you to know that this morning. That you don't stay away from him. You don't withdraw when you fail. When you make mistakes, it's not the time to keep away. You get up, you dust your pants, you run to him. Because his arms is wide open and there's enough space for every one of you in God. That's why with your failures and your faults, it's in him you live and move and have your being. So this is the aspect of God we're looking at in relationship. There are other aspects, like I said, business and all different aspects. But this is, is the main aspect. It must be the foundation. And once you've got this foundation, it's very, very powerful. Now, an inheritance, this younger son, he was very dishonorable, very disrespectful. An inheritance is given after someone passes on. And if the father is wealthy and wants to bless his children before he passes on, that is fine, but it's never a child to ask the father who's alive for an inheritance. It's never ever that. In fact, he was so dishonorable and, and disrespectful to his father that he was literally saying, I want to treat you as dead. Just give me my inheritance. And you know, it is amazing. This is what verse 12 says, the younger of them said unto his father, Father, give me, give me, give me. 
You have to be very careful of a give me attitude. Walking with a chip on your shoulders. You know, it's all by grace. It's because of the love of God. We are what we are by the grace of God, by the love of God. Give me the portion of goods that fall to me. And look at this father. He divided unto them his entire living. Think about that. He's not dead. He's alive. How many of us could have two sons and the younger one is disrespectful and dishonorable and we take everything we have and we put it on the table and we divide it amongst them? I don't know a man like that, but I do know a God like that. That is our God. Now, in the Jewish family and in the Old Testament, the eldest son always received double portion. And so if he divided, and the scripture says he did, he divided unto both of them his living. It does mean that he gave the eldest son two-thirds and the younger one one-third because the eldest one had double portion. However, when you come to the new covenant, please understand this, my family, because a good man leaves an inheritance for his children and children's children, and I'm convinced that no one should, children should get more than the other, and no parent should love one child more than the other. You are bringing, you're opening the door for curses, and it can last generations to come. And so Jesus is the firstborn. And the Bible teaches that we are the church of the firstborn. So Jesus is a double portion inheritance, but we get, every one of his children get a double portion. That is why he said in Jesus said the works that he, would, he did, we will do in greater works. A double portion anointing. So every one of you have a double portion inheritance from God our Father because of Jesus. But look at the son in verse 13, how disrespectful he was after him getting his father's wealth. He says, and after many days, a younger son gathered all together and took his journey into a far country and there wasted his substance with righteous living. Now, you know what? The father knew his son's attitude. He didn't want to stay at home anymore. He wanted to go away. Doesn't want his father's authority. He wants to do it his way. And he took his inheritance and he went into a far country, but there he actually wasted it. And so wealth that is not well managed will always end up in poverty. On Wednesday we look, and I'm so sorry that you, some of you weren't here, and I'm trusting that you will be here. We looked at untidy, slothful people. And Solomon, the wisest and the wealthiest king in the Old Testament, he wrote this because he learned it from his father. And Proverbs 24 verse 30 says, I went to the field of the slothful and by the vineyard of the man void of understanding. The only reason you're careless and slothful, you don't understand the things of God. And lo, it was all grown over with thorns. That's speaking about some people's hearts. And nettles had covered the face thereof. And the stone wall thereof was broken down. And he said, then I saw and considered it well. I looked upon it and received instruction. It's amazing as you look at the outcome of people's lives, how you receive instruction. This is very powerful. Yet a little sleep, a little slumber, 
a little folding of the hands to sleep. That's idleness. My grandmother used to teach me, idleness is the devil's workshop. He says, idleness, so shall thy poverty come as one that traveleth, and thy want as an armed man. You're going to get hijacked by poverty because you are careless, you are slothful. And so this is this younger son, a careless, slothful young man who just didn't want to be under his father and wanted to do it his way. The point is not so much about him, but as much as the father still loved him and did not withdraw his love. But then the Bible says a younger son came to himself because he spent all his substance with harlots. You see, my friends, you'll always have friends to waste your money with. As soon as you have money to waste, you will always have friends galore to use it up and waste it with you. But the day you don't have it, listen carefully to me, the day you don't have money, the friends from so much shrink so much until you'll just have one friend, Jesus, who stick it closer than a brother. There is a friend that stick it closer than a brother. The Bible says he joined himself to a citizen. Remember now, Jesus is telling this parable to the religious Jews. And he tells them they're going to feed pigs. And he start eating pigs' food. I don't know if I'm speaking to somebody here. Maybe a couple. You already started eating pigs' food. The Bible says he was in such want. No man gave anything to him. They can come to a place in your life, my friend, when you leave the father's house. You may think it's still okay. But there can come a place in your life that no one will even want to help you. Because you, pr you push this grace of God too far. You were corrected and you never ever received the instruction. No man gave anything to him. And yet he had to go and join himself to a pig farm. And he had to eat the pig's food. And in that place, he came to himself. This is what he said. He said, in my father's house, there are enough servants that have bread enough and to spare. At least the servants have food to put on the table. And look here, he's talking to himself. Sometimes you've got to talk to yourself. Sometimes there's nobody to talk to. And you have to talk to yourself. He says, here I am and I perish. Even with the basic necessities being denied of me. I got no more food even to eat. I got to go to bins now. I got to eat pig's food. Just however you interpret pig's food is, it can cover a variety of things like sex outside marriage, adultery, fornication, murder, stealing, whatever. It's pig's food. You left the father's house. You wanted to do it your way. But look at the outcome of your life. He says, you know what? I've resolved what I'm going to do. Talking to himself. I'm going to get up from here. I'm going to go back to my father. I'm going to say to my father, I've sinned against heaven. I've sinned against you. I'm no more worthy to be called your son. I took my inheritance. I used all my inheritance up. I got nothing. Just let me be a servant. I live in the servant's quarters. I just need to be a servant. You see, the first thing he said, give me. The next thing he said, make me. 
you see, sometimes we want give me before make me. And we always get into trouble with that. But God has made you a son. Don't get me wrong. He's made you a son. But don't walk with a chip on your shoulders as though you're entitled. It's by grace, through faith. And you walk humbly even in your abundance. And you can see other people and you can look at them and you can say, there goes I but for the grace of God. And have compassion to those who are worse off than you. But he arose and he came to his father. Now the Bible says when he was a great way off in verse 20, the father saw him. Now take notes, the father didn't go and look for him. The father didn't try to go and force him to come out of the pig pen. But the father still loved him. The father waited for him to come in to himself. And I believe I'm speaking to somebody or more than one person here where God your father is waiting for you to come to yourself and to speak to yourself. And the Bible says, if you draw nigh to God, he will draw nigh unto you. When he was still a great way off, his father saw him. Oh, this is what I've been longing for. I can see the father's heart. I can see the veil being drawn. The Bible says, he ran to meet him before he could even come and apologize. And when he ran to meet him, his father grabbed him and kissed him. He's still trying to apologize. My father, my father, I've sinned. I've sinned against heaven. I've sinned against you. I'm not worthy to be your son. Make me one of your hired servants. And yet the father is not even listening to that anymore. He's speaking to the servants. He says, go and get the fatted calf and kill it. Go and get a robe and put it on this my son, put a, a golden ring of sonship back. He must have even uh, got rid of that ring, pawned it or something or sold it. Put shoes, he didn't even have shoes, man. He says, let us be merry for this my son is still my son was lost and is found This my son was dead and is now alive. There's a number of lessons and we're going to pick it up next week and my my time is up. But I want to encourage you today as we come. I got a song. I'm a little bit of the old school. I'm one of those that can pull out from the old and pull out from the new as well. I want you to sit back and listen to this beautiful song of Jimmy Swaggart. And in a few minutes, and I want to pray for you. The song is, it's over now. My friends, it's over for you walking far from God. This is not the time to walk far from someone who loves you so much. This is the time when you must get up and run to your heavenly Father. Greater love had no man than this, that a man should lay down his life for his friends. Will you listen to the song? And God richly bless you. Allow the Holy Spirit to minister to you. I think, if I remember correctly, that Rusty Goodman wrote this song. It really tells a story. And maybe one could say, in a sense, it's the greatest story ever told. Upon the many years 
I've wasted And I think about the many nights of hunger Spent out in the cold I remember warming by the fire The food, father's house and how it tasted Knowing that the life I'm needing Is needing love and love's back there at home That verse once again, please When I look back to yesterday And upon the many years I've wasted And I think about the many nights of hunger Spent out in the cold I remember warm by the fire Father's house And how it was And knowing that the life I'm needing Is needing love and love's back there at home Arms, 
to sing this chorus again because I feel in my spirit that there are some, it may be even just one, but it might be many. The life that you are leading is destroying you, and you know it. For the last few moments, you've heard that still, small voice of the Holy Spirit telling you it's time to go home. It's time to go home. And when you go, you may say, what will they say? I can hear my father say, go kill the fatted calf. <laughs> Spread the table. <laughs> I'm telling you what they'll say. Oh, then go and tell the angels to sing a welcome song. Then bring the finest ring of gold And with it bring the finest robe of sable To place upon the tired and weary shoulders Of my child who's coming home It's over now It's over, I'm going home It's over now It's over now It can't be long Oh, the prisons of my past Couldn't hold me I'm free at last, glory to God I see his arms reaching for me It's over now One more time, please It's over now It's over now It's over, I'm going home It's over now It's over now It came For me, it's over now. My father, I see his arms reaching for me. Thank God, thank God. It's over, over, over now. As we draw the service to a close, I want to pray for you. I don't know what your situation is, but I do know that there are degrees in us turning away from God. Somebody may just have turned a little bit away. Others much more. And then some may be far away now. Or you may say, I'm in the meeting. I am in the house. But you know yourself, you're not where you should be. God loves you so much this morning. He wants to reveal himself as Abba Father to you. He says a, a flickering flame, maybe just a little flame there. Maybe you online, just a little flame. He says he'll not snuff it out. He says a bruised reed, maybe you've been bruised, man, along life's journey. Life circumstances can be very, very harsh, very, very harsh, cruel sometimes. He says, a bruised reel I'll not break. God will never break you. He'll never break you. Believe me, he's a loving heavenly father. He will blow his life on the flame. 
and make you fully alive, burning bright. If you have a bruise, he'll put a healing balm of Gilead this morning and he'll heal you that that place you were bruised is far greater and stronger than any other place. Your test can become a testimony and your mess can become a message. You can say, look what the Lord has done. Listen, friends, clearly what I'm saying to you. I was a drug addict and a mess became my message. I was an alcoholic and an unclean person. It became a message for 45, 45 years. And I'm still trumpeting it out. Look what the Lord has done. I don't know what you're going through. But I do know God wants to just fill his love into your heart. There's nothing that can heal like acceptance. Maybe you've experienced rejection. Rejection is a terrible thing. But God is saying to you that you are accepted in the beloved just as you are. He loves you and he wants to pour that love out in a fresh way into your heart. I want to pray for you. And if you need prayer this morning and just even there in your home or wherever you're watching this, will you just pause, put the pause button on in what you're doing? And if possible, just stand, I'm going to pray for you. You in the meeting here this morning, if you need this prayer, will you slip up to your feet? All over this auditorium, there are many of you that just need to stand. God bless you. Nobody looking around. There are people here that just need to be loved by God, just to be accepted by God. And you slip up to your feet. Quickly now. Quickly now. You stand to your feet. I'm going to pray for you. In the wonderful name of Jesus, you could be rejected right in your family. You could be experiencing rejection as a husband from your wife. You can be experiencing rejection from your husband or from your wife. You stand up. God will accept you. He'll just pour that into you. There's no one that can do you like Jesus. No one can love you like Jesus, believe me. No human being, no one can ever love you like Jesus. I love Anne more than I've ever loved her, but I can't love her like Jesus. And she can't love me like Jesus. There's a vacuum in everyone's heart to be loved by Jesus. Will you slip up to your feet? Many are standing all over. Is there anybody else? I'm going to pray for you. Let's repeat this prayer. Say, Dear Lord Jesus Christ, I need you now more than ever. Thank you for dying on the cross for me. Thank you for shedding your precious blood. Thank you that you have given me forgiveness of sins. Thank you that you accept me just as I am. I see your arms wide open with the eyes of faith. I'm running to you today. Jesus, you are my Lord. You are my Savior. You are my God. And you are my King. Lift me, Lord. I need my needs to be met. The basic needs of life, I need them to be met. I believe you're meeting my needs right now. In Jesus' name, amen and amen and amen and amen. My God supplies all your needs, your dreams, your desires according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Expect a sweeping of the Holy Ghost 
a move of God like you've never known before. Reviving, refreshing, strengthening you in the name of Jesus. I speak into your life that you are on fire for God in the mighty, mighty name of Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah, glory to God. Give him a great hand. I'll see you tonight at six o'clock. Make sure you're in the service. Bye-bye. God bless you.